is in the zoological parks that most people get their first and only look at the wide variety of species in the animal kingdom. Of all the creatures in the zoo, the most fascinating and at the same time the most frightening are the reptiles and the amphibians. I hate it! You don't want to watch that anymore. Yes, I do. They have lizards up on top. What is that? That could eat somebody. Could that eat a person? <laughs> In the wild, the pattern of reptile life varies little. For most, hatched from eggs, they enter the world equipped with all the instincts they will ever need for survival. The king cobra leaves the egg, already primed with lethal venom, capable of seeing, smelling, and hunting. For the king cobra, for the monitor lizard, it is an existence marked by violence. community of fellow creatures, man provides a place for those of higher form. Because of practical need or physical beauty, they are chosen for relationships with humankind. Descending the ladder of biological form, a line is sharply drawn. It is a barrier beyond which human affection rarely extends. This is the world of reptiles and amphibians. are vertebrates like man, but they belong to a group of less perfected animals. Countless forms of life have died out, but the reptiles survived, and in their appearance there is something that suggests a more distant epoch in the Earth's history. As the sun warmed the debris of creation, life emerged on the planet across a time span so vast it cannot be imagined. Primitive plants moved from the seas and took root on land. They covered the earth at water's edge, while other life forms remained in the seas, undergoing the inexorable changes of evolution. More than 350 million years ago, a remarkably altered creature appeared in the waters, the first amphibian. Little different than the amphibians that survive today, they possessed gills, primitive legs, and a fish-like tail. Lungs were developing in the amphibian, and when, for some reason, it could not forage for food beneath the waters, it would be able to survive on land.
Most amphibians came out of the water with a flaw, and it would forever limit their movements. They could not reproduce outside the water, and so were chained to it. But from the amphibian came the reptile that would reproduce on land and spread across the earth. Countless centuries later, on virtually every continent, man would find the awesome traces of their progeny. In Earth's history, few spectacles can match the era when reptiles reach their zenith. For over 100 million years, the greatest of them all, the dinosaurs, ruled the land. Encrusted in sedimentary rock, scientists find occasional traces of the life that once existed. Painstakingly from bits of skeleton, the age of the dinosaurs is being reconstructed. Hello, how's it going? Dr. J.R. McDonald is a paleontologist for the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History. He is currently assembling an exhibit of evolving life. His work is to recreate this past era so that we can visualize what the world was like when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Pretty hard. Well, this seems to be doing a trick just fine. Takes a little longer to set up, but there's plenty of room here for work. Do you think the skin... Kathy and James Bryan are film animators and model builders. With them, Dr. J.R. McDonald elaborates on what is known and what can be shown in a moving diorama of the great age of dinosaurs. What about the color? You think that's good enough? Again, color is something we know nothing about. You can almost take your choice on the color of these things. Of course, living amphibians have quite a range of color. Beyond color, there is the problem of recreating the movements, the method of eating, and combat. Jim Bryan, working under Dr. McDonald's supervision, films a landscape no man has ever seen. The world of the Mesozoic era, over 135 million years ago. In mist and shrouded swamps and forests filled with lush vegetation, a hundred different kinds of giants fed. Among them, Stegosaurus. In his skull, a minute brain presumably governed his actions and behavior, while an enlarged bundle of nerves in his pelvis helped to coordinate the movements of his massive hindquarters. Over 20 feet long, his body was a living fortress, burdened by the weight of bizarre protective armament. In nature's struggle to find an enduring form, new sizes and shapes evolved and disappeared. Triceratops showed a refinement in his armored skull, but despite a fearsome appearance, he was a vegetarian, and his kind were prey to a newly emerging form of predator. Tyrannosaurus rex, the largest and most powerful flesh eater ever to roam our planet, ironically heralded the beginning of the end. With powerful hind limbs and teeth half a foot long, he preyed on the numerous plant eaters, but in his specialization was futility, and his reign would be brief. Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, a roll call of the doomed. They all passed into oblivion. Perhaps they lacked the ability to adapt to a changing environment. Today, no single theory can explain the reasons for their disappearance, for we are left with only scant traces. Testimony to one of nature's noblest experiments. In 100 million years, mammals evolved and achieved domination of the Earth. 
But whatever form they have taken, all higher animals have a reptilian ancestor. major groups of reptiles are common today. Crocodiles and alligators have come relatively unchanged from the era of the dinosaur. The swamps in which they survived are little different from the primeval world of their ancestors. Like all reptiles that remain, they have found a special place in which to flourish. The second group, the turtles and tortoises, have also survived to the present with only minor alterations. A newer form has become the most numerous of the reptiles. They are the highly evolved lizards. From lizards came the most radical product of recent reptile evolution, the snakes, and they have been the most successful of them all. Of all reptiles, the snakes, more than any others, are specially marked in the lore and imagination of man. In Western tradition, the snake is assigned the evil role of tempting Eve in the Garden of Eden. In the East, a great snake is the protector of the Hindu god Vishnu. Although today man has taken the earth in hand, these creatures have left their indelible sign on human history. Scorched by sun, whipped by wind, the desert only grudgingly sustains life. Without forage or water, most warm-blooded animals die quickly. So the desert has become a province of the reptile. Environment largely controls their body temperature. The heat of the sun warms their blood, impelling them to action. As the heat rises, night predators disappear. Mammals seek shelter and the more benign reptiles emerge to feed on desert flowers and small insects. Without an effective mechanism for controlling their body heat, they cannot remain too long in the sun. The difference of a few minutes exposure may mean life or death to a desert reptile. At evening, while the sands retain warmth, predators appear, and so do the desert mammals. At night, the gopher leaves his burrow and follows a familiar trail in search of food. The red diamond-back rattlesnake stalks the gopher, alerted to its presence by an acute sense of smell. Each flick of his tongue brings the scent to his mouth and stimulates his hunting instinct. The gopher's body heat detected by an infrared sensor, directs the strike of the snake. His attack complete, the snake releases his prey. In approximately five minutes, the venom will take effect, killing his victim and starting the digestive process. Even in total darkness, his sense of smell would lead him to the gopher. As all rattlesnakes, the red diamond usually seeks the head before he begins eating. He distends his jaw, making it appear unhinged, in order to swallow an animal far larger in diameter than his throat.
Once he has eaten the gopher, the snake may not hunt again for several weeks. The most toxic of all poisonous snakes thrives in the warm waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Under normal conditions, divers, swimmers and fishermen need not fear the sea snake, but little is known of their behavior. A research team led by naturalist and diver Ben Kropp hunts specimens off Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Though it must return to the surface for air, the sea snake lives, hunts, and in most cases, gives birth to its young in the ocean. At times, sea snakes gather in large groups, and their behavior changes. Normally shy and fearful of man, during the mating season, according to Bancrop, the sea snake turns aggressive, and they will threaten creatures many times their own size. Once a creature of the land, the sea snake adapted in remarkable ways to the environment of the ocean. Their paddle-like tails are useless out of the water, and they are barely able to crawl. The venom of the sea snake is being collected from all over the Indo-Pacific region by scientists in California. A research team at the University of Southern California believes that certain components of the venom may have value in bringing relief from pain. Definite rules govern the lives of all reptiles. The small, slow-moving Jackson's chameleon stakes out a territory in which he will feed and mate. He defends it against the inroads of other male chameleons. The female chameleon never takes part in the ritual combat of the males. A code of battle exists. The defender and intruder test each other's strength until one is pushed into submission. Though the opportunity to bite presents itself, it is generally not done. The highly stylized tournament ends when one of the chameleons has proven himself stronger. The weaker turns tail and the victor assumes his place in the bush or branch. In order to stalk their food, slow-moving chameleons are camouflaged to match their surroundings. A highly disciplined hunter, he waits motionless, scanning the leaves around him in a wide arc, each eye moving independently of the other. Their tongues are sticky projectiles fired at their prey by a sudden contraction of muscles. The distance covered is often as great as the entire length of the chameleon itself. Many reptiles spend their entire lives in the tops of trees. The vine snake of Southeast Asia, perfectly camouflaged, fast moving, he hunts a tree-dwelling lizard called Dracovolans. The lizard's extremely sharp eyes watch for the slightest movement. The 
In an attempt to frighten the snake, Draco Volon stages a threat display. It is both a gesture of defiance and the preparation of a unique defense. As the snake strikes, Draco Volans, the flying dragon, leaps from the tree, spreads his ribs, and glides to safety. For uncounted centuries, Tortuguero Beach in Costa Rica has been the breeding grounds of the green turtles. Each season, thousands of babies hatch in the warm sand, but few last out the first day of infancy. Dr. Archie Carr, professor of zoology at the University of Florida, directs a large-scale program of turtle study and conservation in the Caribbean area. Babies are shipped from Costa Rica to new locales, where it is hoped they will establish new rookeries in which they will be able to increase their numbers. A lifelong study of these gentle creatures has made Dr. Carr the world's foremost authority on sea turtles. The turtles are very, very old. They're, without any doubt, the oldest of existing reptiles. They were on hand when the age of reptiles dawned way back in the beginning of the Mesozoic and they saw such uh, exciting events as the coming and burgeoning of the dinosaurs and then saw the dinosaurs disappear. They saw lots of other things. They survived when hundreds, thousands of other animal lines uh, were not able to survive. And they were able to do so in part because of their shell. There can't be any doubt but that the original innovation that they made was perhaps in large measure responsible for the fact that they lived on 200 million years and more when others have disappeared completely. Besides the shell, the cumbersome turtle has evolved bizarre mechanisms for capturing food. The lumbering alligator snapping turtle hunts in the rivers and lakes of the southeastern United States. Unable to swim after fish, its main food source, the turtle lies quietly in the water resembling a log and opens its mouth. It exposes a fleshy appendage resembling a worm and lures the fish to the turtle. The Mata Mata possesses an equally sophisticated hunting device. As fish pass close by, its throat suddenly expands, creating a powerful suction. Once he's caught his prey, he exhales to disperse the debris drawn in along with the fish. The tortoise hunts no other creature. Instead, he prowls in patient search for leaves and plants and grass. Only once in every year does the tortoise's nature change. Spring is a time of challenge among male tortoises. It begins with a gesture of defiance, a ritual bobbing of heads, and then the charge. Whether for territory or possession of the female, the males will fight until one withdraws or is turned on his back. Now the vanquished must fight for his life. The great protective shell in which he lives becomes a trap Exposed to the sun, within an hour the heat will build up inside his body 
until it kills him. Yet he struggles, for this is the nature of the reptile. Throughout their existence, they have clung tenaciously to the smallest spark of life. So it is that in strange ways, the reptiles have created a place for themselves in the forgotten or forsaken parts of Earth. For much of life on Earth, the rains of spring usher in the season of love. In man, it is perhaps a symbolic renewal. In the aquatic world of the amphibian, it is a meaningful physical signal. Hibernation ends. The amphibians born in the water and capable of living on land awaken from a winter's sleep. Frogs and newts, salamanders and toads obey the command that has moved their kind throughout time. They must return to the water to reproduce. The European alpine newt, a dark-hued male, courts his mate in stately formal dance. The fluttering tail carries a special scent to his lady, a proposal gently conveyed. In the language of his dance, to touch is to request a reply. With patient attention, the suitor persists to catch his lady's eye. A gentle bump plights the trough. The marriage made, the male leads the final steps. As they walk, a spermatophore is released by the male. It will be taken into the female to fertilize her eggs. Warming to lakes and ponds, newly awakened frogs care not for courtship. A winter's sleep incites in them a ravenous hunger for food, any kind of food. satisfied, courtship begins, each male humming a plea to prospective mates. of spring, with mating done, new generations emerge in thousands of different guises. Tadpoles and eggs crowd the banks, occasionally to be captured by a child. In a small jar, they will witness a process resembling the evolution of life from water to land. The time-lapse camera reduces the first three days to seconds, 
and the egg becomes a tadpole. From tadpole to frog suggests the development of fish to amphibian. they came to evolve on land as reptiles and to the waters many have returned the marine iguanas of the Galapagos Islands survived on barren shores by adapting to feed not on land but in the sea through hundreds of thousands of years and countless generations they have foraged along the rocky bottom for algae and seaweed In gross speculation, it is possible to imagine that the marine iguana will adapt more and more to life in the sea, and perhaps become fully aquatic, thus bringing the cycle full turn. Each February, a female marine iguana searches for a nesting site among the lava rocks. Her eggs must incubate under the sand in an area warmed by the sun. Without a nest, there is no chance of the eggs hatching. But few such places are available on the rock-strewn Galapagos. Once she has found a plot of sand, the female iguana will defend it against other females. The combat between females is far more vicious than the highly ritualized territorial battles of most reptiles. Here, reproduction and survival are at stake. Once the fight begins, the iguanas seem oblivious to their surroundings. The nest is left open and the eggs exposed. The nest she so viciously defends from her own species is destroyed by the birds. Iguana's fight for her nest was impelled by an instinct to protect her territory. But apparently a behavioral link is missing. It would seem logical that she would defend her egg. But in the face of its destruction, no impulse signals her to action. And this is one of the lines that clearly divides the reptiles from the higher animals. The iguana wanders away. Next year, she will return to nest again. It was about the 20th or thereabouts of October. The weather conditions were very good for that time of year. Ronald Bremner, age 37, of Scottish origin, a hotel owner, known to friends and associates as a man of clear head and sound mind. I um, came out of the car and looked across towards Castle Urquhart. There and about halfway across was this object, I should say about 35 feet in length. It's certainly not a very fast moving creature. It appeared to me to be basking perhaps in the sun for those late rays on the, the water and it appeared as though this had encouraged the creature to come to the surface.
Since the time of St. Columba, the people of the North Scottish Highlands have propagated tales of a great beast that inhabits a peat-stained body of water known as Loch Ness. From time to time, supporting evidence appears to indicate the possibility that it does exist. In 1960, Timothy Dinsdale filmed a strange wake, which authorities believe was probably caused by an animate object. More startling is the photograph made by a London surgeon visiting the lake in 1934. No one has yet solved the Loch Ness mystery. Clem Skelton is a representative of the privately financed Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau, which maintains a year-round observation and film program. We've been here for seven years. This, is, in fact, is our seventh year here, and uh, our expedition has recorded of itself, getting on for 50 sightings. We have 11 pieces of film. I myself have seen the beast eight times. We could be dealing with a member of the Synaptosaurians. Uh, the Synaptosaurians are the uh, large aquatic reptiles of the dinosaur era. And uh, what in fact we may have here is a form of evolved plesiosaur. We call it Nessie. That's just our sort of pet name for it. We feel rather affection about it, the old girl because she does give us a lovely holiday in a lovely country every year. Somehow, it is always the reptile that is cast as the thing that goes bump in the night. In the upland forests of the Galapagos Islands, explorers and naturalists have discovered that real giants do exist in the reptile world. Cameraman Heinz Seelman and zoologist Dr. Eibel Eibelsfeld record the size of the giant tortoise. Only a few of these unique 500-pound creatures survive in a land where once there were thousands. Wrote William Dampier in 1684, the land turtles are so numerous that five or six hundred men could subsist on them for many months. They are so large and fat and sweet that no pullet eats more pleasantly. So saying, they relentlessly hunted the giant. Hundreds of shells litter old campsites, grim witness to past slaughter. Left to their own, they may survive for upwards of 100 years, living as their ancestors had when they wandered among the feet of the dinosaurs. A timid creature, never hostile, his kind has survived 200 million years of changes on the surface of the earth, but 300 years of savage hunting by man and the continued poaching of today threatens these giants with certain extinction. Remote East Indian islands have often been the fiction writer's favorite setting for the discovery of great monsters. In the lesser Sunda Islands, there is such an island setting. It is called Komodo. The dragon of Komodo. To the natives, Buaya Darat, the crocodile who walks on land. In fact, it is a gargantuan monitor lizard, 10 feet long, weighing twice as much as the largest monitor found anywhere else in the world. Man brought the dog to Komodo long after the dragon had established his superiority as the scavenger and occasional predator. The master of the island for thousands of years, he remains so today. exist in order to bring about a balance in nature. The hunter, 
whether he be dragon or cat, eagle or shark, helps maintain the animal population at a level where there is food enough for all. On Komodo, isolated and unpopulated by man for centuries, no animal competed with the dragon as scavenger and predator, so he flourished. With the advent of man on the island, there came also his domestic animals, the dog and the goat. Some have wandered away and collected in semi-wild herds. For the Komodo, they have become additional prey. The young goats, the weak or the sick, are the only ones that normally will be attacked by the dragon. In time of extreme dryness, famine, or epidemic, the Komodo weeds the ranks of the sick and dying and preserves nature's balance on this remote island. Once the Komodo has made its kill, the wind-borne scent of blood drifts across the island and stirs other dragons from their rest. In much of nature, there exists a hierarchy of feeding after the kill. But among the Komodo, apparently the community feeds at will. Large and small, weak and strong, all seem to share the dragon's feast. It is the isolated reptiles like the Komodo which have created the bizarre legends that have shaped man's view of the reptile world. Since October 1963, a 20-acre patch of desert in Rock Valley in southern Nevada has been used for a unique study of desert wildlife. It is surrounded by a special fence which prevents animals from escaping. Once a month, a team of scientists enters the enclosure and begins a systematic trapping of the confined animals. One of the team members, Bernardo Maza, a mammologist from UCLA, works mainly with representatives of the higher animals found in this desert area, pocket mice and kangaroo rats. A tally sheet is kept on all the animals date and location of capture are recorded. Sexual condition, age and vitality are checked. The data is transferred to IBM punch cards. A computer will then be able to give an accurate picture of their abundance and survival. Maza's work provides background for part of the study. Joseph Lanham covers the Rock Valley enclosure in search of reptiles. Along with Philip Medica, Lanham periodically checks the lizard populations. Each captured lizard is examined. Age and sex are determined, and then the animals are marked and taken back to the exact spot at which they were caught. Other than the hours when the research team is at work, low-level gamma radiation bombards the enclosure, simulating conditions which might exist in the wake of a large-scale nuclear war. 
Studies of pocket mice indicate that if present trends persist, the irradiated mice would become extinct in less than 10 years. After five years of almost constant irradiation, the most common lizard in Rock Valley has shown no ill effects. Reptiles once ruled the earth. In countless centuries of change, they lost supremacy. But they survived, plodding patiently across time. They do not seek dominion. But if the world became unfit for higher animals, who then would inherit the earth? When man elects his deities, he chooses that which fascinates or frightens him. So the reptile occupies a special niche in the superstitions of many cultures. In Pakistan, near the shrine of a Muslim saint, the ancient crocodile is kept in a special pond and tended by the guardians of the temple. Each day brings an offering of raw meat and tender ablution. To modern scientists, the special characteristics of the reptile that inspire fear and awe have become subjects of study. At Western Reserve University, Dr. Sidney Simpson, Jr. conducts a unique experimental program. What we are interested in, in my laboratory, is the regeneration or the regrowth of a new tail on this lizard. Now, one of the first questions I'm always asked is, why study lizard tail regeneration? Well, there are several reasons for this. The first being that if a lizard can regenerate a complex structure, such as a tail, a structure which is certainly as complex as my arm, why can't I regenerate an arm? And it is the hope of most of us working on problems of regeneration that by understanding how these lower vertebrates actually regenerate a tail, that we may be able eventually to apply this body of knowledge to regeneration in man. Out of the dim reaches of Earth's past, they came, alien creatures to the eye of man. They exist and flourish out of view, often in lonely, forgotten places. And there they will stay, so long as there remains the rays of the sun to warm their blood and an instinct for survival dating back 300 million years. enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. Driven by thirst and hunger, Africa's striped horses run a treacherous gauntlet. For 300 miles, zebras race through a spectacular but sinister landscape. Caught in an ancient dance of struggle and survival. 
witness the wonder of creation. The battle for dominance. And the grasslands' oldest and newest dangers. <laughs> National Geographic takes you on an extraordinary journey with zebra patterns in the grass. Count three, go. In two. Two. Between 1968 and 1972, 24 men left the Earth and journeyed to the moon. This is the film they brought back, and these are their words. Stand by for touchdown. This is going to be spectacular. I felt uh, at home there, even though the Earth was a long ways away. I look at the size of that rock. Good deal, boy. There is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won for the progress of all mankind. Join National Geographic for a wondrous journey into the unknown. Man must explore. For all mankind.